many people, if you talk about green jobs, what they think of is the technology, whether it's wind turbines, solar panels, or else it will be something like recycling and overflowing recycling boxes. But there's a wider element to green jobs. It's not just about the technology, it's about a reduced impact on the environment, it's about good working conditions, and also about being able to earn a decent income. What we're going to look at in this short film is three London businesses. We're, um, we're in Acorn House, mm -hmm. which is a restaurant in King's Cross. So we're about a 500 metre walk from King's Cross Station. So what makes Acorn House different then to, to most other restaurants in London? I think importantly, on one level, it's not different at all. Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally what Acorn House is is a restaurant. So it wants to serve the best food that it can you know, with some excellence. What makes it equally fundamentally different is that that food's served in a context where our sustainable, eco, ethical, whatever you want to call it, um, context is actually very strong and drives the restaurant and drives how we, who we are and how we behave. And what sort of challenges have you found in actually trying to operate? Well, we're developing a business plan at the moment for a green laundry because what we do is we generate lots of linen. You know, lots of this stuff gets very dirty. And we've discovered two companies who've kind of stitched up hotel and restaurant lawn industries in England, and in London particularly. And we found a chemical engineer who can do 15 cubic litres of water for a cycle, not 36. As long as we don't get turmeric on this, he doesn't have to use bleach. You know, there's a whole series of learning that you get out of this. And what we've done is we've contacted lots of people in the, in the restaurant industry that we know and have said, if we open a green laundry, would you use it? And their immediate response is, you know what, if it's not any more expensive and it comes back white and we get green credentials, we'll use it tomorrow. Fantastic. But I understand that training is also a very important part of what happens here. The issue for us, Shoreditch Trust is a, is a, a charitable regeneration agency, so our focus is Shoreditch. I mean, we, we operate outside of it, we operate internationally, but all of our, if we make money, it comes back into investment in Shoreditch. And one of the biggest things is, 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 is maximising the potential of our, of our people, you know, be they young or old. And it's, not a, it's actually being able to get people into work, in, into the sorts of jobs that aren't dead end things that just take them off a list and tick a box. You know, it's actually about something that gives them a future. And so having training opportunities in the restaurant was very important to us. What, again, what we were able to do very creatively was look at how you have your average sort of, you know, run of the mill catering training. But then on top of that, you add a whole range of issues around sustainability, eco, you know, eco politics and how animals are you know, slaughtered, how you do this, how you, you know, all this kind of stuff that the trainees absolutely love because it's completely different. So where do you see all of this being maybe in, in two years time? The honest answer is, I don't know. Um, I think there's still, I think green politics and, and and, and, you, and you, may, you may grin wryly when I say this, but it's a bit like racism. You know, people aren't in this country mostly overtly racist anymore. They found very insidious ways to be racist. And I think it's exactly the same with green politics. People used to poo-poo it as a bunch of lunatics sitting on the fringe. Now they realize it's quite serious. So they'll be very serious to your effect, but they'll find very insidious ways of still saying, actually, you're a bit weird, aren't you? You know, you're doing this because you're, you're not quite mainstream, you're not quite compliant with your medication. You know, and my view is, I have no idea where it's going to be in two years' time, but what we will keep doing is chipping away doing what we do and building a head of steam in our own community, which evidence is there that this can be done in other communities. Well, we're now going to look at a very different business, the Arcola Theatre Company, which is established in Dalston in, in Hackney in London. And theatre, of course, has always been a form of social commentary. It's seen as a way sometimes to change culture. Well, one of the things that's different about Arcola is it's not just looking at the content of its plays, it's also looking at the way in which its whole company is run to really try and become a carbon neutral company. And Arcola is, it's an off West End theatre, which means the quality of the art is pretty good, um, which is in fact probably the thing I do least, I'm least involved in. Um, what I work a lot on is our environmental sustainability policy um, and our community engagement, sort of youth and community program. Um, and I suppose the reason we're talking is because what we've found is that these three strands of work actually go together really, really well. Because of my background, my, my sort of formal training was in fuel cells, which is a kind of next generation energy technology. Um, 
and I suppose we've done a lot of work on using fuel cells and actually what's really interesting about fuel cells without going into the science of them is that the fuel cells give you a very expensive source of power. You get power when you want it but it's expensive and so what it forces you then to do is look at well how are you using your energy. So what we've looked at is saying okay let's look at this new energy technology and let's look at what you're using it for. Typically in this case lighting. So our first product which we launched just a few weeks ago in fact is called Highlight which is a hydrogen fuel cell generator that we then package with some really low energy lighting um, so you, we're targeting sort of live events, festival type applications where very often you'll have people running an old dirty diesel generator, usually way oversized, powering some really part of those horrible tungsten garage floodlights that burn really hot, about 500 watts for no good reason. Um, and so targeting applications where you can take that kind of stuff and say, okay, you don't need a generator that big. Running generators at part load, incredibly inefficient. You might as well just pour diesel on the ground. Um, so let's get rid of the generator and then also at the same time then let's tackle the lighting and say so you can take a 500 watt floodlight and replace it with a 12 watt floodlight. You're just moving into a new space which has got a lot of work going on at the moment with volunteers and yourself, your own expertise. What are you trying to achieve in this new amazing space? It's a good question. Um, so what we, we're, so we're, where our colour is at the moment, um, we, we've been for the last 10 years, we're, we're losing that space. Um, so what we've got at the moment is we're very happy that we have uh, UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland, have sent us 65 graduates today um, who we have at the moment um, in, in colour works, um, painting, ripping out old walls, uh, taking out broken glass. You, but, I mean, the area of London that you're working in is a really diverse area, which mm. also has quite a lot of poverty as well as people, you know, who are relatively well off. How do you find it works across, you know, the work that you're doing here, the sustainability side of it works across all those dimensions? Mm. Or are there people who are still excluded? If you, if you do something and you do it well and you become high profile, you will attract the more aware people mm. and you'll start to pull people further afield and typically you'll move up through the SES groups. Uh, so in running the theatre, it's about having a volunteer programme to then setting up sort of training apprenticeship programmes. So yes, you can take your Oxbridge graduates with mum and dad to fund them for the first year, but actually there's another route in where people come in and they start earning money almost straight away. So they don't need to have that pillow behind them to be able to get into the, into the arts. Well, we're here at Calvert's, which is a business which has now been running well over 30 years. It has a history as a workers' cooperative, but also is a business that has made a transition on the environmental side, as well as looking at the issues around working conditions. Can you tell us something a bit about the background to Calvert's, what makes it different? Um, essentially, we've traded for 33 years as a sort of radical common ownership cooperative. Um, the other thing that probably marks us out therefore is the kind of clients we've worked with over the years, Every, everyone you know, from the new social movements, women's movements, various cultural movements, the green movements in the early days. Um, although we've always always also made our money working for, for corporate clients and other design agencies. So the, the, the working conditions side of it which has been is an issue I think for, for quite a lot of companies that might see themselves as having quite an environmental agenda but don't yeah. necessarily see that as linking to working conditions. Yeah. In a sense, Calvert starts, started with working conditions. Start, started the other way around. So the, the, in essence, you could say that the mission of the cooperative is to provide decent jobs. Um, so uh, you know, that, that, the, the, essence of, the essence of that was looking at the conditions of our work, our hours, what we were paid, the, the sort of level of what we call respect at work. It's a, it's a big issue for us that, that you know, we're treated, we treat each other with respect, we demand respect from our clients and our suppliers. Um, but also looking at, looking at sort of the physical working conditions. So early on we, know, we realized that some of the chemicals we were using were giving people dermatitis and uh, breathing problems and, and you know, the, things like MEK and some of the hand cleaners were really very nasty chemicals. So as an aspect of having, a, having control over our own working conditions, we were able to start looking, trying to find alternatives to these chemicals. Were there any other triggers as well that helped make the company more environmentally conscious? In terms of the things that we, that we purchase, the things that we buy, our materials, our papers, our inks, um, we, do use, we do use some of the labelling schemes. We found the Forestry Stewardship Council certification chain of custody scheme to be very useful for 
trying to improve the, 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 the environmental quality of the virgin fibre paper that we use. Um, so yes, we, we do rely on we rely on the, on the certification scheme, but we also have always relied on common sense. So where do you see the, the business being in the next, I don't know, two to five years? We've, we, so we will probably still be doing printing, but we'll be doing, it, we'll be doing much shorter run work. We'll be doing maybe 10, 20, 300 copies rather than 5, 10, 15,000 copies. It'll be much higher quality. It'll become a, a much higher value product. Um, and we'll be working much more widely as designers and consultants with our clients to look at those issues. We're, I mean, one of the things that people talk about green jobs is the, the new technology coming through. How much do you think that new technology will be a driver in change? There are always people looking to create a technical, technological edge to create greater efficiencies and greater productivity so that you can get advantage in the marketplace, so you can produce more and more stuff. There's a, there is a, you know, there is this beast, beast in the belly of, the, of, of, of business which makes it want to grow all the time, and we're not immune from that because we have to, you know, to survive, and and have decent working conditions and and pay our way, and you know, we have to we have to compete, and that means we have to invest, and that means we're caught up in this cycle of more, 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 more all the time, and that's a, it's a very difficult thing to break out of. We can't do it as a single company. Um, you know, I, th I think we need a, a wider evaluation of you know, the idea that growth cannot go on in the way it has done. I mean, it just can't. It's, you know, growth, growth as we think of it is unsustainable full stop. And business is the biggest driver of that, that, that thing. So, um, you know, there are big questions for us as a business, but they're not necessarily questions that we can answer on our own. The three London businesses we've been looking at are all pretty typical businesses that you could find in any large city. But what makes them special is that they're trying to have a more ethical dimension, looking to be sustainable businesses. So how does all of this fit with the European Union's desire to be this low carbon economy, this different force for the future in the EU 2020 strategy? Well, I'm with my green colleague, Elizabeth Schroeter, who wrote the report for the Employment Committee, which has now been taken on board as parliamentary policy. Can you just tell, it, tell me a little bit about your report? Uh, we overcome one failure of the Commission. The Commission speaks one time about sustainable development, sustainable strategy, and one time about employment. And we combine this both. So what, what would you say the key message of your report is? We in particular show the huge job potential on this and we described in this report also the possibilities how to use this job potential and what are the measures. What do you think that governments can be doing, particularly at the European level? What can we be doing at the European level? Commissions should uh, push the member state, should set up frameworks, uh, also legal frameworks, should uh, concentrate uh, the financial instruments on the purpose on uh, economic transformation, including job creation. Well, I'm joined now by Commissioner Andor, who's the Commissioner for Employment and Social Affairs. So we're just going to discuss a little bit about, you know, where does the European Union fit in this? How is the policy development going to help those companies that we're, we're seeing at, at the grassroots to really develop? And so how do you think that the, the new sort of Europe 2020 strategy sort of carries those, the ideas of a sustainable economy forward? Out of the three key objectives of the Europe 2020 strategy, which was approved this year, we have uh, one for smart growth, one for sustainable growth and one for uh, inclusive growth and uh, green jobs. They represent the overlap mm. between the sustainability and the job creation objectives. What do you think the Commission's role is then in, in sort of pushing this sustainable Well, uh, first of all, the Commission brings the Member States to the commitment uh, to really uh, shift uh, and meet uh, the ambition that has been expressed. And of course Parliament did uh, its, its own report sort of around the, the, the sort of green jobs dimension with um, my, my colleague Elizabeth Schroeter. So is that also going to be feeding into the, the Commission's considerations? Absolutely. Then? I think uh, one of the key messages of uh, the report by uh, Elizabeth Schroeter was that uh, green jobs uh, should be found everywhere, in every profession, in every sector. 
how much of a challenge do you think that is, sort of mainstreaming this this more sort of resource efficient? Uh, it needs uh, assistance in order to identify what needs to be done in certain professions and also support financially the training efforts. That's why within the European Social Fund, for which I'm responsible in the Commission, we will introduce uh, a green jobs objective. It still needs to be defined uh, how exactly it would be done, but it's a clear objective for us to use the European Social Fund to help this shift uh, for the working people in Europe. Because uh, the net effect on jobs is probably positive. There's sometimes fear, which I hear about, that uh, the restructuring of the economy towards uh, the green objectives would mean losing jobs. In my view, it uh, would help to create a lot of jobs, um, low-skilled, unskilled, but high-skilled as well, on all, in all segments of the labour market. Uh, and based on the Stern report, which I think uh, was a milestone, we, we can be confident that uh, uh, the net effect on jobs would be positive. Europe needs to create jobs while at the same time reducing our environmental impact. Elizabeth Schroeder's report and the three businesses that we've seen, very different businesses that we've seen in London, show us how we can do that. And the Commission now as well needs to be investing in training and really pushing member states to step up to the mark so that they are making these changes as well. Because now more than ever we need smart, inclusive and sustainable businesses that create jobs so that everyone feels that their work is worthwhile and really contributes to a better world. Every job, a green job.